Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. Today with us in our studio in Paris, one of the living legend among war reporters, one, one of the most famous British journalists, John Swain. Hello. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for being with us. You are here in Paris with good news. Uh, finally, uh, 22 years af after being, uh, being published, your memoir, your book has been translated in, in, uh, in, in France. This is uh, River of Time, which is an iconic book. Uh, even if you are here, I can say it is an iconic book uh, all around the, the, the world. It's translated in French now at the, the Equator uh, Publishing uh, uh, co Company. So I wanted to uh, first to ask you a, a, a question because in the few in, in the first pages you are writing I didn't want to to trade nostalgia what do you mean by this well uh, Indochina is is, uh, is a place which uh, particularly in the war uh, uh, captured the imagination of all, every so many Westerners who were there whether they were French planters soldiers uh, American soldiers journalists all of that, um, and war changes people and changes me, and uh, I didn't want to very more give a sense that I was nostalgic for war, or I have certainly nostalgic for the countries I was in, but they were going through the most horrendous times, so one shouldn't be nostalgic about that. But, but even so, it, it, it's, a, it's a place which is, stands apart and marked me very strongly and marked other people. So in that sense, one is nostalgic. Is it, uh, you think, uh, was it a, a way also to say adieu, to say farewell to Indochina, all your memories as a young journalist uh, uh, being caught in this uh, major uh, war uh, in Indochina? Writing the book was a way to um, put uh, in, into hard covers, uh, so to, between hard covers, my experiences and, uh, in Indochina as a war correspondent, a young war correspondent. But it's also a book about coming of age, really. It's a book from going from uh, uh, going, uh, entering adulthood in, 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 by confronting uh, uh, horrific situations um, uh, in one of the most exotic and beautiful places in the world. You are very nicely uh, using the Mekong River, uh, which is namely um, the, uh, the mother of, of waters, uh, if, you, if you go by the, the strictly the, the, the name, and you're using uh, the Mekong River as an analogy of memorial or uh, of a lot of censors, uh, but you are also saying, you're writing, the Mekong is not as innocent as it seems. What do you mean by that? Ah, well, um, one has a romantic vision of the Mekong, which is the most beautiful river, and uh, I've travelled uh, long lengths of it, uh, not, not in China, but in Indochina, uh, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. Um, I've seen it in its ferocity in the Kokong Falls, uh, uh, up in where, uh, the border between Laos and Cambodia, uh, and then it becomes more gentle, uh, it, it, the river flow anyway, uh, it's certainly in the dry season. But I've also seen it, it, it travels through lands which were it, at that time were, were at war, mm -hmm. and the most horrific things were happening uh, all around the Mekong, and I used to see bodies floating down the Mekong of people who'd been massacred, a lot of them civilians. The, as I said, the book is, a, is, a, is an iconic book overseas. Uh, it was published 22 years ago and very, very famous, one of the key books uh, regarding the memories of uh, the Indochina, uh, Indochina uh, uh, war. The question is, how do we explain uh, why in France uh, we were covering the Indochina war, the intercolonial uh, uh, wars in Indochina? It took 22 years to be translated for the French public. Would you say or think that there is maybe in France and in the West particularly some problems to face bad memories? Because this is, by the way, a war we, we lost the, as French, as Algeria, and was quite difficult to address to the public these kind of memories. Maybe a little bit, but I think that um, the main reason it wasn't translated into French, to be honest with you, was that my English publishers were lazy about trying to promote it in France. Um, and. I didn't do much about it myself, but I always, in the background, very much wanted it to be translated into French. I have a very strong attachment to France um, in all sorts of different ways, and of course that was, that, it was moving to the former French colonies of Vietnam and Cambodia um, made that even more strong for me. Um, I, I think that um, I, I think that uh, there is a 
yes, there's a there's a tendency by Western countries to turn their to try and forget and turn their back on those uh, colonial episodes. At the same time, um, it's it's the Americans were not too eager as well no. to address the the defeat in in Vietnam a few years later. Uh, no, the Americans particularly are. Uh, um, You know, they uh, are very bitter in defeat and magnanimous in victory, as we as we saw from the Second World War. You describe in the in the in some some of the most somber pages, very sinister, some things you have been, some events you have been uh, uh, witnessing uh, regarding the the event, the tragic event of the boat people from Vietnam leaving after 75, uh, going into ICs in the in the Chi China Sea. I wanted to ask you, as a reporter, are you Uh, combine this with your memories, your heart, your spirit as a witness of this such tragic, because what you are describing is extremely violent. Uh, John Swain, do you live with ghosts? Sometimes, less so now because I'm older. Um, but uh, yes, absolutely. And uh, when I'm confronted, for, for example, by photographs uh, of uh, of. Southeast Asian children, uh, Southeast Asian people, people mm. from Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, um, in, in difficult circumstances, I'm really, really touched because I know, I can see in their faces what I saw in their, in their faces back in 1970 to 1975 when I was there. I can see how they, how they express fear, how they express terror, how they express hunger. Mm. It's, 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 uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's really sort of pricks my heart. Do you think it's These uh, events, when you were still young men, built you or destroyed you? What is the the percentage? I think it built me, but I'm, the question is, I'm not the same person, obviously, that I was all those years ago. But I think that I mean, someone said to me, "There's no such thing as a bad experience." I don't really, because you can learn from it, um, but that's a bit tough, actually. Um, but I mean, you know, I, I'm terribly. What the important thing is, Cyril, that I, I'm, you know, journalists are terribly privileged. I was very privileged to be there at a young age. I was very privileged to um, to, to see those things, horrible as they were, to see life at its um, most horrendous, at the really at the sharp end, and to see. Um, Yes, lots of suffering, but also see terrific humanity, you know, human beings helping each other as well. And that marks you. So, so from that point of view, I don't think it turned me into a cynic. Um, back to the, the boat people tragedy, I wanted to ask you your reflection after decades of covering wars all around, all around the world. It looks like uh, history uh, teaches nothing because we have the very same boat people tragedy in the Indian Ocean, in the Mediterranean, we have refugees all around the world and still the same main problems of corrupt governments, uh, the lack of understanding of willing to do something by, by the international uh, community. What is your reflection? Did it worth to doing all what you did? Well, it doesn't nullify what I did. I think it's very dispiriting that these things just repeat themselves. History repeats itself. I'm not one of those journalists who uh, believe they can change the world by what they've written mm. um, at all. I mean, I think that's incredibly pretentious. Um, but uh, I think, you know, trying to write what you see and what you feel as a journalist, uh, because we are we are in a privileged place which other, and, and leading your readers mm. uh, as if they're on your shoulders so they can actually see what you see and bring it home to them, I think that has to be, has to be a good thing. There are some beautiful pages and lines you are writing in your book. You mention this beauty into sadness, tristesse majestueuse, uh, in French. I would like to ask you how you reconcile these apparent contradictions between violence, barbaric actions you have been witnessing, and this beauty out of this, especially what you have, we, you have been witnessing in, in Cambodia. How do you reconcile that? Or how is it possible? Well, I think that I, I think that human beings have two sides to them, and um, uh, I think one of the things that I came away with is that and, uh, is that uh, human beings, even in even in, you know in, in, in these places, uh, in the most exotic places, can behave disgustingly towards each other, and they can be led very badly by people who encourage that, um, uh, and that's what happened in Cambodia. I mean, there's a. You know, there's a famous French expression, which is the Surya Khmer, the Khmer smile, because the Cambodians always smile. Um, and so they have us, and they have a very beautiful people. But um, 
the famous Cambodian king, uh, king, King Norodom of the 19th century, who said to uh, French uh, co colonial office officers, he said, you've got to realise the Cambodians are like water buffalo in the, in the rice fields. Mm. Um, they seem to be very placid, but if you provoke them too much, they go completely mad and get very, very angry. And that's what happens. Do you think the, your, your uh, human and professional experience, uh, back to a few decades ago, you, you have been experiencing in, in Southeast Asia, will be possible today? Um, I think largely not. I think it's, you know, journalism has changed so very much. Um, I mean, in, you know, now, first of all, you can't get away from your, um, from your office, your, your foreign editor or your editor. Um, you've got a mobile phone with you all the time. Um, he's in touch with you all the time, asking you what, what you see, telling you where to go. You, you, one has lost one's independence. I love to... Uh, you know, be a solitary figure wandering around reporting what I see. And now, of course, it's that all that has changed. Plus, you know, obviously, you know, the, the world is, you know, like in Syria, is very dangerous for Western reporters to go to. But at the same time, you know, we, we lost in Cambodia um, 20 journalists, more than 20 journalists in, in eight weeks. I mean, it was a horrific casualty figure. Uh, they're either killed or still missing, so they're dead. Um, that was out of a press corps for about 60. So, and that figure has never been matched, even in Syria. Um, it is extraordinary. And that was the Khmer Rouge, who were, um, I've sort of sometimes said they were the precursors of ISIS, um, I, I mean, but not from, a, not from a religious point of view or anything like that, but or they were just um, psychopathic, and they killed anyone that they, uh, who encroached on their territory, um, not to have publicity or anything like that, like, mm. like ISIS has done. Um, but to Daesh, um, but just, just out of a pathological hatred of them. John Swain, thank you very much. This is the end of the France 24 interview. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.